It's great to be back with you. Um, I got a little flack from the other pastors for writing a sermon series and then taking off to go pheasant hunting during the adultery talk. So uh, <laughs> wasn't on purpose. I was a little bummed out about it. So we'll hit a little bit of that today too. Because as we work through the Sermon on the Mount, as we talk through these topics, what we're, what we're really doing is, is, is a really powerful thing. I just need you to settle in on me with this. Man, we are reading the very words of Jesus Christ. I mean, a sermon that he gave that was, that was written down, that was preserved. I mean, we can go back to original manuscripts that go all the way back to 100 AD. That, and, and as we read, read them, they say this. I mean, it is an unbelievable thing. And I think, you know, sort of that reverence for the sacred word, we really got to recapture that in our culture. Because I think the Bible's gotten a little too commercialized. You know, it's on mugs and on Twitter, and it's all these little snippets of stuff. But to really, really settle in on what it is that we are doing here, we are sitting at the feet of Jesus, just like the first disciples, and we're allowing him to teach us what is normal as your disciple. That we want Jesus to redefine that normal. And so part of today as we talk through treasures, we're going to be talking through the reality of idolatry. And, and I, we got some worship volunteers that are going to be handing out a piece of paper that will be used later on in the sermon. So keep your eye open for them and grab one of those um, as we work through this. Uh, a resource in my life, a book that I read, was by an author by uh, the name Darren Patrick, and he's a pastor and, um, and, a, and a writer. And he wrote this book called Church Planter, but he had a chapter in there that, that was called Idol Shattering. Idol Shattering, because to talk through the topic of treasure, treasure of earth, treasure of heaven, what we really have to talk about is idolatry. So we're, we're going to go back quickly to where idolatry started and, and just to see the tactics and the moves that Satan's going to use in our life and that we are predisposed to as sinful human beings. And so as we go back to Genesis, to our first mother and father, Adam and Eve are chilling in the garden. God created them. He put all this wonderful stuff around them and they're enjoying it and they're doing whatever you do in the Garden of Eden and that's what they were doing. And then one day, Satan comes, who is called the deceiver, a liar, and the original lie that he used to tempt them was the lie of this, that you can't really trust God. He's got his own agenda, he's pretty bossy, right? He's got his own things going on, and he doesn't really care, he's not really in it for your good. And if you really want to secure your happiness, and if you really want to secure what you think is best for your life, the, your best bet is go around him and get it for yourself. Basically, the original temptation was the phrase that has become all too common in our culture of, you do you. That's basically what Satan said. You want the fruit? You do you. I mean, who knows your happiness better than you do? Who knows what you want better than you do, so you do you. As long as it doesn't hurt somebody else, you do you. The original sin, the original lie, because the reality is the one who knows you better than you is the one who made you. Idolatry is when we go to something that has been created and we look to get from it what only God can give us. And any good thing can become a God thing when you place more significance, more worth, more purpose on it than it was designed to give you. When you elevate it on the pedestal as the thing and the object that I worship, where I get my significance, where I get my truth, that's what I go to. It becomes a treasure of the earth that I hold up and I say, this will be who I am. And any good thing can become a God thing when we do that to it. 
That first sin of Adam and Eve, it often talks about the fall into sin. And it's so much deeper than that. It's not like falling into a ditch or, or, they, or they caught sin, like you catch the flu. It's not like that. Adam and Eve made a willful decision, a fundamental choice to break their relationship with God. When they turned to this piece of fruit and they said, that fruit, that will get me my purpose, my worth, my wisdom. That will get me where I need to go. God will not. God's holding out on me. God's not to be trusted. But the fruit, that'll get me where I need to go. So they had to go around God to get the fruit, fundamentally breaking the relationship. And, and the thing about it is today, man, the, that same fruit hangs everywhere. It's just different for everyone. But the same temptation is now in our veins because we are a product of the fall. We have that original sin. We have that propensity to selfishness, self-preservation. You do you. There's a reason why in our culture so many things are pushing towards just you do whatever you like, don't, like, right? Because that is the original sin. It is self-focus, the arrow of one's life curved in on self, hyper self-focus, my life, my thing, my way, no one get in my way. The problem with that is that's just not Christianity. And that's not what it means to be a creator. Now, now Jesus is preaching this sermon to his disciples. This is meant for the disciples. Those who don't have the Holy Spirit, those who are not following Jesus, they're probably not going to get a whole lot of this truth. But for us who are following Jesus and want to learn from him, this is incredibly powerful. Now, I got to tell you, this sermon's weighty, all right? There's a heaviness as you get into the teachings of Jesus. I had a guy yesterday after the sermon came up and he said, oh, you know, like, good guilt trip, pastor. Kind of joking, you know, nudge, nudge. And I'm like, I love it when people do that because you're telling me more about you than me, right? And so you guys are like, I'm not talking to him after the sermon, right? He's like, nice guilt trip, Pastor. And I was like, oh, I was like, I go, well, I go, and, and, and not like, I'm not trying to like, I'm not poking at him. It's in fun. I'm like, what do you feel guilty about? Because <laughs> you know there's a righteous, holy guilt. The Holy Spirit will... The, See, there's a righteous guilt that happens when God gets his hand on one of those rocks and he starts pulling it to the surface. And we're like, I didn't know that was there. Or, oh gosh, I didn't know that you knew that was there, God. He's like, of course I know that's there. And then you feel this guilt. Now, good holy guilt will push you to the cross of Jesus. Unholy guilt, like a guilt complex, when Satan accuses us, that pushes us away from the cross. That's how you know the difference. So if you're feeling the kind of guilt where it's like, fallen before the Lord, I'm sorry, that's not, like, that's good. That's good. But if you have the kind of guilt that like keeps you away from Jesus, like God wouldn't want me or that, that's not good. All right, so you got to know the difference between the guilt caused by Satan, the guilt caused by the Holy Spirit. But you might feel guilty at the end of that. I don't know what the Holy Spirit will do in your own personal life. You might walk out of here and be like, meh, whatever. Maybe you'll feel that heaviness of like, oh, yeah, let me. I don't know, but I'm just telling you it might happen. So I forewarned you. Throughout our lives and throughout the world, are things in disguise that, that are called like, God imposters. And they're everywhere. God imposters are either people or stuff, or maybe even a dream, that make promises to you, that just like Satan did, that, that you should trust this thing to give you your ultimate significance and worth and identity and passion and a future. 
that if you just buy this, or if you just find this person, or if you just get this job, or if you just have this career, if you just retire at this age, if you just, if you just, if you just, if you just, but you realize that amongst all of them, what they're really saying is you are not complete. There are gaps to you. I have what will fill the gap. Trust me. Listen to me. Every commercial's dangling to you the good life. Drive the Jeep. Buy the truck. Buy the clothes. Get the yacht. Whatever it is, they're dangling to you the good life. Wake up at 4 a.m. and go to the store for a Black Friday deal and then you'll be content. It's consumerism 101. Good marketing, by the way. I have to create gap in your life. I have to make you feel incomplete as a person. Then I fill the gap so you buy the product. That's what Satan did. And that is literally what it takes to lead you away from God. The difficulty with that is because when Jesus Christ came, he came to restore your full identity. Jesus came to say, I know who you are. I know what you're about because I created you. And in me, you are complete. You're perfect. You're whole. In me. And idolatry is ultimately saying, Jesus, you're not enough. God, you're not enough. You know, last week, again, you guys looked at adultery, and, and it's the same conversation. Adultery is a matter of the heart. It's a matter of our desires. It's, it's, it's when we desire, when we lust after, when we believe that this other person or thing, <clears throat> excuse me, will fulfill us outside of what we have been given by God in a spouse or what God gives us in himself. It's saying, I need to go around you. I got to go around my spouse. I got to go around what God has given me to get what I know I really need. And at the heart of it is selfishness. It's sin. Because you're going around your creator, God, just like in the garden. It's, it's basically turning to God and saying, God, you're not enough. Or it's turning to your spouse and saying, you're not enough. I know what's best for me. And that's at the heart of it. It's a self-focus and a self-preservation. And it comes when we treasure something of the earth, when we put more weight on it. You know, the word worship, it comes from this old English phrase, meaning worth shape. And even in the way that, even in the word of worship, uh, there's a, Part of that definition that says, what we worship will shape us into a particular kind of person. I'll give you a silly example. So my older brother was telling me a story about his dog uh, when we were out hunting. He told me a story about his dog where when they give a rawhide bone to his dog, this dog will latch onto this bone in such a way that it like ruins its life. This dog gets anxious, it gets protective. Anybody else have a dog like this? And it will spend all its time guarding the bone. Like it'll put it on its bed and people walk by and, and snarl and ah, get away and, and it'll hide it in the house. And it's just this anxious, it doesn't even sleep well because it's just anxious. And so in love, my brother's got to go and take this bone away. They stopped giving rawhides to his dog because of this. Take the bone away. He said, almost immediately, this dog will relax and just go sleep. It's like it's in peace. He told me this story, and I was thinking about it. I was like, man, that's a lot like how human beings are. See, all the rawhides are different, but, but I'm sure you've had a time in your life when something in this world has drawn you to it, and you want to get your hands on it, and pull it in close and protect it. And when people come into your life and they try to talk about it, it's like, get away, her. And you start snarling at people and you get protective, you know? Oh, you know it's Sunday afternoon football time. Er, er. No, it's Saturday. I got to go to the game. Er, get away. Er. And you start holding on to that rawhide. Whatever it might be, realizing any good thing can become a God thing. 
And whatever we worship, whatever our object of worship is, whatever we treasure will shape us. It changes our thoughts, our desires, our personality. That's why Jesus gave this teaching in Matthew 6 when he says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. What he means by treasures is the things you put your identity in, your worth, your significance. Don't lay up your worth, who you are as a person, in things of this earth because you're susceptible. Moth and rust destroy. Thieves can break in and steal. And if the thief breaks in and steals something that you have placed your person into, they didn't just take stuff, they took you. You see this happen a lot, and, it, and I, it's, this is hard for me. What I'm about to say is hard for me too. But it's, it's like when you lose that job or you retire, and then it's like, if I'm not doctor this person or teacher this person or pastor this person or this thing, who am I? Or when the kids move out of the house, if I'm not mom in this way or dad in this way, Who am I? You know, I I, I would use this phrase before where like, you know, if I lost my wife or I've lost my daughter, who would I be as a person? I started thinking on that. Would it be painful? Yeah, of course. Duh. But is my ultimate worth only as a father? Is my ultimate identity only as a husband? Are they amazing things? Yes. Are they meant to be enjoyed? Yes. Are they blessings of God? Yes. But is it ultimately, fundamentally, who I am? And Jesus would say, no. You are mine. You are my child. I bought you. And who you are hasn't changed. See, if we lay up for ourselves treasures on earth, we are susceptible to losing ourselves. Because everything of earth, it is temporary. There will be a day when those are no more. So Jesus says, there's another way of living as my disciples And that's why he's teaching this. There's another way. Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. Moth and rust can't destroy. Thieves cannot break in and steal. See, if you put your worth and your value, your identity, who you are, into something beyond this world, whoa, that's next level living. That means this, the things of this world can't touch it. They can't steal it. They can't destroy it. So Jesus is saying, be careful. Be careful what your treasure is because in that treasure you will find your heart. Jesus Jesus is not saying don't like stop providing for your family or working hard for provision or enjoying the things God's created. A lot of people make this teaching just about money, but it's deeper than money. Is it about money? Sure. Is it more than money? Absolutely. It's like adultery. Yes, of course, it's about the physical act. Yes, of course, but it's deeper than that. And the treasure in heaven, treasure on earth, it's deeper than that. It's, it's fundamentally remembering who you are, whose you are, who the giver of the good gifts is, and ultimately where your forever home will be. The treasure of heaven is the one who stepped out of heaven to reclaim your life through his death and resurrection. Jesus is the treasure of heaven. Jesus is saying, I'm the treasure of heaven. You're complete in me. Lay up for yourself treasure of heaven, meaning focus, 
Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. And then Jesus miraculously took himself, the treasure of heaven, and put himself in his believers through the Holy Spirit. In you is the same spirit that was in Jesus, making you a treasure of heaven. So as Christians, as followers of Jesus, how do we lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven? By connecting people with Jesus. See, ultimately what Jesus is teaching in this section, remember who you are, remember what I've done for you, and remember what your purpose is in this world. That the only eternal thing you will interact with today is people. The only eternal thing in this room people. So Jesus says that if you truly want to find yourself, live your life for people. Not just to grow a kingdom here in this world, not just to accumulate more stuff, not just to grow a bank account, not just, not just. He's saying live your life for people. That the blessings of our life were given to us to be used for, pe- say it, people. Man, we got this phrase we use at my home where nothing's more important than people. And I'm trying to teach my daughter, right? She's five and a half, trying to teach her nothing's more important than people. So some things we do, like if you're watching a show and somebody comes home from work, you pause it, you turn it off, you go say hi. Because nothing, shows are not more important than People, when you get home from church, you want to turn the NFL game on, right? Right? NFL games are not more important than people. We don't take our cell phones to the dining room table. That's not a time for that. Because who we are as a family is more important than our cell phone. Or if somebody wants to play with her toys and she needs to share, we go share your toys. Why? Because your toys are not more important than people. It's people. The focus is people. People are hard. People are difficult. People are sometimes a pain. But guess what? So are you to Jesus sometimes. And he loved you so much that he went to a cross for you, that he gave his life for you, that he brought you back from the dead. And he says, this is who you are. You are mine. And I want you to live for the things I lived for. People, so often you will know you have something in your life that is an idol because it's holding you back from loving people. To serve Jesus is to love people and to love them with the love that he first gave to you. So a way that Jesus is going to love us And it, it's not, it, it's kind of like in, in, in Hebrews when all discipline is painful in the moment. This one's painful and this is why it's heavy, but in love, I gotta say it to you. One of the ways that Jesus is going to love you is by waging war against the idols of your life. Jesus will not be second to anything. And just like a good parent watching their child get into something that's not good for them, love is not sitting by and saying, you do you. Love as a parent is hard and gritty, and it gets into the mess for the sake of the child you love. That is Jesus in your life. He wants to break new ground. He wants to grow the peaceful fruit of right. He wants you to move in ways that maybe you didn't even know possible. But the painful part is he first has to take the treasure. He's got to take the rawhide bone. He's got to take this thing that we've been clinging to, this idea we've been clinging to. He's got to expose our idols and in love shatter them and break them and take them. 
Let me give you some practical examples. When I was at seminary, I think I've shared this story, but it's so practical. When I was at seminary, it was the first time I had DVR, meaning I could tape sports. Terrible. I would tape every college basketball game. And I got an opportunity to do prison ministry, something I had been wanting to do. But it was on Monday night. It's a big night for college basketball. I said no to doing prison ministry. That next Monday, I laid down on my couch to watch some college basketball. I, will, I am not lying to you. I sat down, I turned it on, and I felt terrible. Like it tasted bad. I was not getting any pleasure from this. It wasn't fun. I'm like, what is going on? He made my sin taste bad. Is watching college basketball bad? No, it's a good thing. I made it a God thing by it getting in the way of people. And God, in love, took it away. To this day, I very rarely watch live sports. If literally there is nothing else to do, I might sit down and watch some of a game. In my life, that it was massive. I lived for it. You should see me in March. I lived for it. But in love, God had to take the rawhide bone of live sports because I was starting to snarl at people. I was starting to get protective. I was starting to do some not healthy things for my life. He had to take that. I could go down the list of my life, but it's not just about me. It's also about, what about you? You know it's an idol because it's impeding your relationship with God or it's impeding your service to other people. And any good thing can become a God thing when we place more significance, more value, more purpose in it than God himself. Now, on that piece of paper that you were handed are 10 questions. 10 questions. Questions get at the heart of things. 10 questions that expose idols. Now, this is where you're going to have to make a decision. Because it's one thing to listen to a sermon. Anyone can do that. The real question is, is how serious are you about Jesus cultivating your heart? To follow Jesus takes a raw authenticity to come honestly to our God and saying, God, expose me. Cultivate me. Remove from me things that are not of your will. I want to be about you. Do I have to change my job? I'll change my job. Do we have to move? We'll move. Do we got to open up our home to, for others to come? Whatever, literally God, whatever, you just let me know. You cultivate that, but I am open, I am willing, I'm going to be honest about it and being honest with myself. I'm telling you, our sin, <coughs> excuse me, lies to us all the time. What did Adam and Eve do right after they sinned? Where did they go? They hid in a bush. Our sin makes, makes us want to hide, draw back, pull back. What is something I could bring up right now where you're like, oh man, he's talking to me? That's the thing. I'm t- we all have them. I-, I got stuff in my life. I'm working through this. I'm in process. I'm not there yet. None of us are. But I think some of us need that reminder of the ongoing sanctification that the Holy Spirit's going to have in our life and to take that seriously. What do, you, what do we worry about the most? What if I failed or I lost it would cause me to feel I didn't even want to live anymore? What do I use to comfort myself when things go bad or get difficult? What do I use to cope? What are my release valves? What do I use to feel better? Or what do I do? What preoccupies me? What do I dream about? Right? It's all these questions. And the more honest you are with them, it cultivates things out. So in closing, 
It's sort of a recap. Knowing God is our greatest treasure. And being known by God is the greatest of treasures. Jesus is the treasure of heaven. And we lay up treasure in heaven as we follow him, as we serve others, as we connect people to his love, storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven when we know who we are, what we're about, what we're living for is not of this earth, but of something greater. And there is a joy and a peace and a passion that is otherworldly, next level living. And it can't be stolen from you. It can't be tarnished. It can't disappear. But it's in Jesus Christ. And it is real. I'm telling you, it's real. And it's available to all who will surrender to Jesus Christ saying, you are Lord. I follow you. It's not about me. It's about you. I surrender it to you. My hopes, my dreams, my future, my security is in your hands. Lead me, God. Talk to me, God. I follow you. It's a beautiful way of living. And I pray that each and every one of you would take it serious. Lean into it so that you will experience more and more of the peaceful fruit of righteousness that comes after the discipline and cultivation. May God bless each and every one of you as we fix our eyes on Jesus. Amen?